Low again, it's Cliff here from Down Under, with Tormac moving over to BT30 for some of their new MX machines. I imagine some of you will be thinking about what type of BT30 tool holders are available and whether these low cost ones made in China for a few dollars are going to work. So I bought a couple of these low cost holders from uh, AliExpress and um, had a good close look at them and I thought I'd make a bit of a video partly about that, showing you some of the pitfalls and ways that you can improve them. And in the second part of the video, if you're interested in a BT30 automatic tool changer Arbor for your ITTP probe, I'll go into how you can modify a tool holder and make it into a impact tolerant touch probe Arbor, a nice compact Arbor for your probe. So if you look in AliExpress or Amazon or eBay and put something like BT30 boring bar holder into the search bar, you'll see a whole lot of different options. Here we have some very cheap options, obviously made in China. Uh, and they must be subsidized by somebody. You can't make them for that. It's the steel, the heat treatment, the machining, the grinding and the shipping. Come on, let's get real here. Anyway, um, here's one BT30, $20. Uh, or BT40, $26. And here's the tool holder BT30 to ER32 from a seller on AliExpress, Hosley Little Jungle Store. 99.7% positive review. I think 13 reviews, most of them being 5 star. $23 US, including shipping. Similar tool holder made by Mari Tool, Mari Tool in the US is $104.60 US, and I presume shipping is additional. So I bought a few into my shop here in New Zealand and they are ridiculously cheap. I mean a hardened and ground holder from China supplied into New Zealand including shipping for around 25 US dollars. I mean, we can't even ship internationally for that price. So it makes me think well there must be Chinese subsidies going on here or at least a pretty uh, distorted control of the exchange rate. But anyway I got a couple in because I wanted to have a look at what was the quality of them like. So this video I'll be doing some inspections and discussing that. Just set up that arbor in the lathe and um, you know I've talked about this before I've got this chuck floating on the back plate so I can dial it in concentric on that diameter and then come down to this part because it's ground between centers, this should all be concentric. And then I can get that true by tapping it and check that that's dialed. And so I've got the whole thing running perfectly concentric now. That's the beauty of these chucks that, three jaw chucks that float on their back plate, is that you can dial something in perfectly concentric. So I've got that perfectly concentric. Um, but there's more to it than that. It's really important that the internals are concentric as well. And if you look on the inside, you can see that the bore has been bored out, probably with a carbide boring tool, after it's been heat treated. And that's reasonably concentric. That's within a hundredth of a millimeter or so of concentric. So you think, ah, that's perfectly good. But it isn't that simple. The thread that was put in before heat treatment was probably not done very well. If you tighten that up and put a dial indicator on there, the thread is off and it's pulling the whole thing, pulling the whole thing off. Let's just have a look at that now. I'll put it in gear and run it with a drill in it and you can see how much out it is. 
have a look at that. So what happened is, <clears throat> when they originally, that's not just the, the distortion of the heat treatment, that's when they drill the original hole. The drill's acting like uh, an internal dial indicator probe. And you can see how much it's out. So when they drill the original hole, they didn't use good drilling practices and they've got drill wander and that hole is on an angle so that the threads on an angle so even though, they've, even though they've corrected the front of the thread uh, the bore diameter that location diameter there which is I think from memory 12.5 the thread beyond it, it will be running out and so the whole pull stud is running out it's not a lot but you can see there's an error there and this is what concerns me about a lot of these low-cost manufacturers you think you're getting a bargain but in reality there's almost always you know all of these low-cost tools if I check them for long enough I find a serious fault Okay, let's look closely at another type of BT30 holder made by a low-cost manufacturer in China. We'll set it up in the lathe between centers. We can rotate it here between stationary centers. Don't rotate the spindle if you're going to use this method. Just rotate the part and then you won't be introducing any extra errors. You can see that the cylindrically ground surface, a very nice ground surface on the taper and on these diameters. And you can see that they've all been ground in the same setting. It's very good quality, nice finish, very concentric if I rotate it between the centers. If I put it down there on the taper, very concentric. But the problem is, you study it for a while, you begin to see problems. If I look on the end face, that the threaded portion uh, is adjacent to so the actual body of the uh, tool holder screws up against that end flange face I can see that it's not been cylindrically ground it's been hard turned in the lathe and if I put a dial indicator on that surface look it's running way out that's 0.1 of a millimeter that's four foul run out so that's evidence that that has not been ground between centers. It's been hard turned. And if you sort of think of the process they must have used to make it, what they would have done is roughed the whole holder out, the whole arbor out, then hardened it, and then hard turned this thread and face. Now the problem is that they would have probably held it in a chuck on that, on that heat treated rough surface machine that, then put it in cent between centers and ground the surface. So there's either a lack of care or a lack of understanding of the process they're using is incorrect and the errors that are generated that result from that. So they're either unaware of it or they don't care about it. And of course a lot of people won't be checking for this. So you're going to have a run out of your uh, tool holder that you bolt onto the arbor of about four thou. You know this this is a common thing. They get it right in some areas and they miss the boat somewhere else. Then there's often a problem with the drive dogs and the drive dog slots on these low cost tool tools. Here's a good quality Clarkson tool holder, and if you put it into the 30 taper, there should be clearance there. You should be able to rattle it when it's in contact with the taper. So let's have a look at this tool holder here, this low cost holder that we just checked. That's fine, there's clearance there, not a problem. So it, they're just drive dogs, they're not interfering with the fit or alignment of the assembly. But this one here, which is a uh, ER32 collet holder, it's really important that that's concentric, it's a collet holder. If we put that in there, it's such a close fit on the drive dogs that there's no clearance. 
So there's not even any point in testing it with a dial indicator. I have and it runs out. But of course it runs out because there's an interference fit there or um, such a close fit. These drive dogs are never going to be perfectly uh, in position and the slots are never going to be perfectly in position. So it's always going to be biasing the holder off. You must have clearance there. If there's not clearance there and you buy a low cost holder like this, you'll have to set it up in the mill with a carbide end mill and machine a little bit of clearance. Either in the cross flats dimension or across the width of the drive dog slot because there must be clearance there. You otherwise it'll interfere with the concentricity of that holder, whatever type of holder you have. Then there's the BT30 taper itself. Let's just have a look at that. So obviously it's important that this angle is correct and that the diameter, the relative diameter is correct so that the so that the position, the lengthways position is right. You know, it, it can't vary too much because you've got a pull stud screwed in the end and if the height difference or the length difference varies too much, it won't suit your pull stud arrangement. Um, so there's that and there's the angle. The angle must be right. We, I've just put some blue in there and checked it and um, also tried to rattle it in the taper and they seem to have done a good job of getting the angle correct as far as I can see. I haven't spent a lot of time checking it but it feels good. It feels like a very close fit on the taper. So the cylindrical grinding on this seems to be really good. I'm not sure about the uh, effective length where the pull stud is. I haven't checked that, but the angle seems to be correct in this taper anyway. So they're very capable uh, machinists when they want to be. It's just that there's inconsistencies in some aspects of these tools. So if you need to skim the sides of the drive dog slot, you could set it up in the vise something like that and get a carbide cutter and just shave a little bit off each side so that you've got clearance. So you know if you're going to buy these cheap um, tool holders then check all of those different things and correct them so that it's usable. Now, So let's say you've got a Hallmark ITTP probe or something similar, uh, you're thinking of buying one but also you're thinking in the future you may change over to BT30 or BT40 or some other taper. Um, can you get these probes with different types of shanks? Well the short answer is that's not a practical way forward. It's far better just to have a standardized shank um, for several reasons. One is that inside this TTS shank there is the long travel retract mechanism. So because the Hallmark probe has this long travel retract mechanism within its 3 quarter inch shank, it's much simpler if you want to change over to BT30 or 40 etc just to buy a suitable tool holder that will accept that 3 quarter inch shank such as this BT30 to ER32 with a 3 quarter inch collet in it or this BT30 to a boring bar style holder and modify it. I'll just take you through the modification process. It's quite simple and that makes a very short compact assembly. These cheap holders really are hard. I mean it's not just hardened and tempered mild steel to make it look like it's hardened. It really is hardened. Um, it's in the mid 50s rock will see if not harder and it's a big struggle for a high speed steel drill to drill it but if you have a good high speed steel it'll be in the 60s rock will see and with plenty of coolant you can do it I'd start from the end with the thread in it that's a M12 by 1.75 pitch put a good jet of coolant on it and uh, run the RPM quite slow uh, make sure the chips don't jam in the end. You can clear them out with a hook piece of wire. And uh, keep it cutting. Don't let it rub. Yeah. 
there you go, you can hear it cutting. That won't take too long. Well there we are, that only took a few minutes. So once you get a hole through the middle, the rest is easy because you can bore it with tungsten carbide. And tungsten carbide is much harder than high speed steel. So I managed to drill that hardened arbor with this good quality high speed steel tool. It's uh, an industrial brand. You, you won't manage it with a cheap, uh, poor quality high speed steel drill, but a good industrial brand you will. Uh, unless it's above 60 Rockwell C, because these drills are above 60 Rockwell C. And what I did was, just to strengthen the cutting edge, is that I ground, can you see that there? I ground a little bit of the uh, face off on a different angle, there and there, so that it's not got quite as much top rake or top clearance. Um, it's not negative but it's sort of neutral and that gives it a stronger edge you can see it's very slightly worn so it's hard hard on it it needs a jet of coolant and you've got to keep it cutting and you need to hook out any chips that get in front of the drill otherwise you could chip it um, so that went through fine but all else fails and your arbor is harder than 60 Rockwell C which is unlikely you couldn't get a tungsten carbide masonry drill like this and grind it on a diamond wheel to get it really sharp and that's a low cost tool concrete drill grind it sharp then you've got a tool which is tungsten carbide and that will drill without any problem at all so once you've got a hole through the middle of these arbors the rest is easy and now with a carbide turning tool, we'll face it off. It's a lot harder than soft steel. Well, taking the facing cut where I'm skimming the surface for part of the diameter and then taking off the central core where it's well below the surface, I'm getting two different surface finishes. So I'm not so sure now that it is through hardened. They may have used a case hardening grade and carburized it and case hardened it so that the surface is much more hard than the central area and the central area has been still hardened into a high tensile range. So it could be uh, that they've done a very good job of heat treatment where it's a classic carburizing of the surface and increase of to high tensile of the core. I'm not sure I could put it in a Rockwell C tester and measure across that face, but I don't have one handy. You probably know most tungsten carbide inserts are just pressed and they're not razor sharp so for the finishing cut it's a good idea to use a diamond lap and just lap a razor sharp cutting edge so that you're just machining off a little bit of dust of work you can see that very fine shaving on there it's just taking off the last few tenths of a thou and you can get a nice close fit with that diamond lapped. It's only a cheap insert but you can see now that's a, a ring fit in there and I don't really even need to put a grub screw in. I could just put some uh, CRC on there to prevent corrosion or long life CRC and then just press it in. Uh, but I may put a grub screw in it just for the sake of the video. Well now I want to put in a grub screw um, in this case hardened or through hardened steel so I've got a high speed steel center drill it's going to be decidedly dodgy I've deliberately chosen one that's got a shortened spigot or I could just snap the spigot off so let's he see how it goes <laughs> not nice it's hard it's just doing it wow it's uh, at least 55 on the surface it's a little bit softer now though 
So for a six mil grub screw, I've put in a eight millimeter. Is that uh, uh, five sixteen uh, center drill? Just to clear away the hard hard surface material, and we still got a tough material underneath, but I think it'll be tappable. So I'll put in a five mil drill now, and we can run a six mil tap through. I think I'll use an old tap and sharpen it. I've shown how to do that in previous videos. Uh, so that we might just dull the edge of the tap, but it won't matter because it's an old tap. Well, that drilled okay. I put in a 5.2 drill because we don't need a massive uh, depth of thread for this little grub screw. So I've got an old blunt tap and ground the end off square and sharpened it. There's a video on this about a year ago, if you look back through my videos. For uh, borderline situations, it saves you wrecking a good tap. Now I'm just going to uh, switch the spindle on and get it started square and then finish it off by hand. Now it's started square, I can screw it through by hand. Nice sharp tap, just been sharpened, and there we have it, an M6 grub screw. Well there we are, that's with the M6 grub screw in, and we're all ready to go. So that was quite a quick and simple job, even though it was tough steel, tough as old boots, less than an hour's work to convert it into a very compact uh, adapter. So with the M6 grub screw, it's, you probably know this, it's a good idea to put a little slug of uh, copper or aluminium or brass under the grub screw so that it doesn't bruise on any critical diameter. Or better still, uh, drill the end of the grub screw and turn up a little aluminium or copper spigot and push it in there. And you can make a, a set of these of different sizes, it's really handy for gripping on precision diameters where you don't want to damage them with the grub screw. So that's all ready to go now. We can get our pull stud and screw it in. Assuming you've got an ATC, automatic tool changer, which I don't have. And then, uh, for example, your ITTP can go in. And there we are, a nice compact Arbor BT30 to ITTP. And uh, you can nip up the grub screw, although that one's a nice snug fit and I don't really need to. Now remember, it doesn't matter if it's not perfectly concentric because you've got a lot of dial in adjustment on these ITTP Hallmark probes, and uh, as long as you're not turning it around within the holder. Um, it's going to stay concentric relative to the BT30 taper. Another option is something like this Mari Tool BT30 3 quarter inch end mill holder. That's only $81 and um, it's quite a compact little unit that you could insert your TTS shank straight into. So just to summarize, um, you could go for a quality product like this and not have any issues. And if you're considering whether or not you should stay with TTS or go to BT30, um, remember with uh, BT30, it sticks further out of the spindle because of the drive dogs and the clearances required there. Um, if you look back on my YouTube channel Thread Express about a year ago, I'll try and remember to put a link in the description below. I've done uh, four videos, R8 TTS versus BT30 spindle tapers. The pros and the cons, the relative merits, part one, two, three, and four series wrap up. Um, I'll try and put a link in there and uh, you can refresh yourself on some of those details if you're trying to decide which way to go. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Cheers.